Hi there, folks. Today we're going to talk about decision making and building a system for decision making on your farm. This is some artwork from one of my granddaughters, and this might kind of be a great visual for the chaos that is happening in your farm business because there isn't a system for decision making. So this month's blog talks about the work by Courtney Pullen, whose book is Intentional Wealth, How Families Build Legacy of Stewardship and Financial Health. And it speaks to having effective family systems. So strong value, strong families know their values, what's important to them. And in our farm team, there's a high value for honesty, transparency, teamwork, challenge, they also know what their vision is for the future, their, what they want to accomplish, and their mission is, is knowing their why, why they're doing the things the way they're doing. So knowing why you're operating your farm and what your goal is to create a, so, a solid foundation is what Pullen calls your anchor. And I know some of you know the hymn, We Have an Anchor. So what is, what is your foundation for decision making? How are you making decisions as a family? And how do you create action items from your system for family governance? So some decisions with how your family actually happens as a family is actually different. It's called a family council. So where you're going to take holidays, who's going to take time off, how you're going to celebrate Thanksgiving or Christmas or Easter or other things you like to celebrate. All of those things are how you run your family system. But for your family business, you need some kind of structure or anchor around governance to do strategic thinking. So how farm business decisions are made comes from the understanding of the structure and the process of the farm family business. So here are some of Poulin's tips and just put this on the sticky side of your mind. Number one, start with what you have. And I heard a podcast this week that said, if it's meeting on the tailgate, you're meeting on the tailgate. You're not necessarily meeting in a boardroom uh, sometimes you're meeting at the kitchen table, but that's not really family governance because it's not a formal meeting place unless you've formalized it with an agenda, flip charts, uh, cell phones off, and uh, uh, whether you're doing operation decision making or whether you're doing strategic thinking and planning for the business operation in terms of transition, capital projects, and all those other kinds of things. So start with what you have. It doesn't have to be complicated. Keep it simple is uh, Poulin's second thing. And I keep it simple with a flip chart, a cell phone to take pictures of the notes on the flip chart at the end of the meeting, and um, making sure everybody has a voice. And many times you've heard me talk about talking sticks as well. Focus on people's strengths and what they can bring to the table. So the person who loves detail and has numbers is going to give the financial report update. The person who loves people and relationship is going to give the HR update for your farm business. And the person who loves um, family harmony and uh, understanding uh, people's basic needs is going to make sure there's hot coffee and snacks provided. All of the things that make a great meeting and having governance and having a system of making decisions. And then you also want to have a person who's a good facilitator, who can keep it safe and respectful and understands farm family conflict and communication and conflict resolution and being conflict aware. So you want to foster leadership within the family. And I've heard families who rotate, who chairs the family governance meetings to give everybody a chance at practicing what it's like to call the meeting to order, give some structure and make sure the agenda has been pre-approved or gone out ahead of time. Because you're going to have some people in your farm family who are process people. That's not me. I'm the people person. So I'm taking care of the emotional factors affecting planning and the communication and the conflict resolution while my daughter-in-law would be taking care of the details and my son in -law, my son would be taking care of the HR and people stuff and my husband would definitely be taking care of the agenda and what tasks need to be completed on time. We all have different personal styles and we all have different strengths. So foster leadership within your family. The next one, number five, Poulin says, is to emphasize ongoing communication through having regular meetings. And this is maybe something that you're not great at, but even twice a year is better than never. And in our family, we tend to have the meetings when there's a task or a certain decision that needs the input of all parties. 
You, number six is to establish a formal structure with governance model that works for you. And I'm involved in a private um, apartment situation where I'm the secretary and other person's the president. But when we have meetings, we use a meeting template where I'm putting what was discussed, who's responsible, and by when are they accountable for bringing that to the next decision place. So some kind of structure, especially of keep, keeping track of what's decided and how, is really important to have. So the best time to start working on improving your systems for decision making on your farm is now. Again, start where where you're at is what Courtney Poulin recommends. So here's a question that causes some angst. What is your policy for loans or gifts to family members? And this is an example that Poulin uses in his book because you might want to have a cooling off period uh, for, and also folks may need to consult. And in our partnership, my husband knows that I don't want to know every micro detail of what capital projects are happening on the farm. But when he's going to be spending more than 10 grand, I like to kind of know about it to be kept in the loop. So set up some kind of policy around um, money transfer in the farm uh, family and consult with each other before giving an answer. Because sometimes people just want to be consulted. Second generation family members would like to follow the same process and consult with the parents if, it, if the question was asked of them. So I remember a coaching family that was quietly writing very large checks for about $5,000 actually to a non-farm family member in, um, in the city. And this became a huge conflict issue because decisions were being made about money without everybody's input. And that's what you want to avoid. You want your, your goal in my mind is collaborative decision making. So here's a few more questions to ask. What is the overall vision for family participation? Who gets to be part of the decisions and what kinds of decisions? So do you have voting rights? If you're a corporate farm in terms of decision making, do you use a consensus model or is it by uh, voting? And I believe that every member of the family and their spouses should be part of your governance model, especially if the spouses just want to be kept in the loop. They might not have voting rights but at least they're sitting at the table and understanding why certain decisions were made. And the why in conflict resolution is your intent. And when you're really good at sharing your intent, it goes down a lot better for people when there's hard decisions being made. So I want to caution you about not making assumptions as to who might be left out of your meetings. Oh, it'd be much easier if we just let the women out of it. Yes, this still happens in this decade. And that's not a great attitude, folks, because women in agriculture bring a lot to the table, a lot of skills, a lot of strength, and create a lot of opportunity. So don't make assumptions. Ask everybody what kind of participation they would like to have to declare what level of involvement they would like to contribute to the decision-making process. And some folks like the non-farm spouses who don't want to be totally involved in the farm business, which is another thing that we're dealing with now, where some people say, eh, you're the farmer, it's your business, I don't need to be there, I don't want to have any input, okay, fine. But what kind of things do they want to know how decisions are being made? And here's another good anchor question. Who gets to be an owner? How do those new owners pay for their interest? And how do they exit? So this policy gives clarity to the debt servicing and the business structure and how you make decisions around uh, financing your debt. And I remember I once had a young farmer who was just beside himself because he didn't know how much he was worth with his own personal wealth. So he went to a federal lending agency and he said, hey, how much can I borrow and how much do you think I can service based on the assets I've shown you I had? And he came back to the family meeting and said to his dad, dad, I can write you a check for $750,000. And the father was in tears because he was elated that there is a solution created because he didn't want to have to tell his son that he couldn't roll everything over. Another thing is, what is the criteria to work in the business? How are the roles determined? And you can read my other blogs um, on having clear job descriptions. And I highly recommend that you go to WhitmanConsulting.com. Whitman is W-I-T-T-M-A-N, WhitmanConsulting.com, and look at Dick Whitman's amazing farm management binder, which is a great 
investment that you can make for the same price as a night in a good hotel. And it will really help you give templates around job descriptions, compensation, performance agreements, and things that are probably niggling at you that are decisions that are not currently being addressed well in your farm business. So how is compensation determined? What is the process for hiring family members? How do you foster leadership with personal development plans? And I'm an old 4 h We learn to do by doing, which is why Poland recommends that you give everybody opportunities to lead the governance meetings and who decides how performance is eva- evaluated. So on Dick Whitman's farm, he is part of um, that business and sits on the board of directors with other advisors, but it's his daughter now who is the CEO. So your farm CEO may listen and learn from the family and have the ultimate decision-making while still being in close communication with the family office. And your board of advisors, like an accountant, a lawyer, a peer, somebody may help implement policy and be a great training ground for your younger family members to learn more about business and leadership. So there's the other news flash. Take your teenagers with you when you go to the accountant or see your advisors and get them to start developing relationships early. So a model and a system for making great decisions on the farm is likely unique to your farm family culture and preferences, i.e. there's no right or wrong way, but you should be having a way to have effective decision making. The key is to have a process that everyone buys into for making effective decisions. So this has been a bit of a longer video, but it's important for everybody to understand that they can have a voice at the table and that their voice counts. And again, if you practice shutting out people and don't explain why certain decisions are making, you are stewing up something that's not going to be fun in the future. So I just really encourage you to go back to these tips. Start with what you have. Keep it appropriately simple. Focus on your strength. Foster leadership within your family. Emphasize ongoing communication with your regular meetings. And if it's tough in the beginning, use a facilitator and establish a formal structure of governance that works for you. See you next time.